Conversations are at the heart of everything we do, but how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Hey everyone, Tim from Unifor here with a special episode of B2B EQ for this week. I've had the pleasure of speaking with so many amazing figures in the greater sales community, and each episode has been packed full of insights and advice. What we've done today is compile a few snippets from past episodes around the topic of creating confidence in buyers. We've taken some really awesome, actionable insights that you can start implementing today to help your conversion rates. First up, Richard Harris. Our first clip is from episode 13. Richard is the founder of the Harris Consulting Group, co-host of the Surf and Sales podcast with Scott Lees, and a podcast that I was so lucky to join him on and continue the conversation. Make sure you check it out. But during this conversation on B2B EQ, I was really fascinated by this concept of earning the right to ask questions, which we dove into more. So here's that clip. Uh, let's, let's be honest, sales is not brain surgery. So, I, you know, I, I, but, uh, but yes, I agree. I, I do agree with you. Bedside manner is important. Well, and, and, and being that, that curious George type person that goes, oh, well, well, tell me why it's hurting. What are the activities you're doing right. during the day? What's causing it? Well, okay, you're doing this. Don't, now I get it. Yeah. Now I can help you with that. Yeah. It, it takes you to that root cause. I think it's the same reason NASA used to, they came out with that, you know, ask why five times. Right. Totally. Totally. Just, totally. just don't ask why five times because you might really frustrate a prospect on the phone. Yes. Agreed. <laughs> Use the other questions. Use the so. other questions, which goes into your, your ability to coach people in terms of earning the ability to ask the right questions. I want to focus on that word earning. Yeah. Yeah. How do you do that? So um, it's taught a lot of different ways. Uh, and, and, you know, let's talk a little bit about the, the why. Mm -hmm. If we go into a sales call, already knowing we're going to ask questions, which, you know, I hope the prospect knows, um, we don't want it to be an interrogation or an interview. Like mm -hmm. we don't want to make them uncomfortable. And we want to give them space to ask us questions. So this earning the right to ask questions is really trying to set the parameters around creating a safe space for a conversation. That's really what we're doing for both parties. And so for me, I do, a, I call it a respect contract and, you know, let, let's just role play it, but we're going to go through time, goals, agenda, potential outcomes, um, you know, a uh, uh, social contract, and then, you know, a transition statement. So let's just role play it, Tim. You ready? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, hey, Tim, it's Richard. How you doing? Hey, Richard. Good. How are you? Great. Hey, I've got this down for 25 minutes. Does that still work for you? Yeah, that should work on my calendar. Great. Any hard stops I should be aware of? Right at the half an hour mark. Okay, great. So what we'll do is maybe we'll just call a timeout with five minutes left and make sure we just sort of can figure out where we are and determine what the next steps look like and, and go from there. Is that okay? I appreciate it. Yeah. Sure. And, you know, just so you know, Tim, I think we're both on this, uh, fact finding slash figuring out a mutual frame of reference conversation. You know, I'm sure you have questions for me. I know I've got some questions for you. Um, is there something particular you actually want to cover today? Um, yeah, there's a few topics I might want to touch on. Okay, great. Tim just gave me like more topics. <laughs> One, two, three. Uh, great. So yeah, I'll be sure we cover those, Tim. Um, and, you know, Tim, just so you know, look, if at any point you feel like this isn't the right fit, please say so. I promise you're not going to offend me. And likewise, if I discover that I can't help you, I'll be the first to tell you. And, I, and I'll even be able to tell you who you probably should talk to. Um, yeah, I want to do business with people, but I don't need to do bad business with people. Um, is that fair? That's fair. Great. The last thing I really need to do, Tim, is send you reaching out, checking in, and following up emails that I know you hate getting and that I definitely don't like sending. So thank you. Um, so, so Tim, you know, aside from what you, you know, put on the, the form that you're having some challenges around blank and blank, what else even got us here? What, what's making you even want to take the conversation today? 
you know, I, I keep trying to figure out how to get time out. All right, stop. Here we go. Yep. So that's the respect contract. We talked about time. We talked about goals of the conversation. We talked about a little in uh, a little agenda. We talked about that we could both walk away. We talked about that. Um, I don't want to help him because he yeah. knows what happened. Um, and then we transitioned out of that. So that's my version of a respect contract. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have. You're like, okay, Tim or, or Richard, tell me about this or I like that part or whatever. So Yeah, well, I, I love how you position it to mutual fact finding. I think yeah. one of the things that, that and, and I'm just role, role playing, it, but still the impact it had as I'm hearing and feeling myself, right? Because I'm thinking, mm-hmm. okay, self-awareness of how am I feeling about this? It's making me open up and it's making me go, oh, we're both in this discovery together. That's a key point. That That's a huge piece. That's a huge piece of that. They're doing discovery on me too. So yeah. I got to, you know, I got to be open. I, I, I love that because that opens up the door. The fact that you say, hey, th- there's a right to move on. Like, like you yep. give that right and you, you, you open it up to somebody rather than the idea of, which I think we've all had, whether it's in a virtual room or in a real office. The door mm-hmm. is closing and the person's like fighting to get their foot in the door. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and that that changes the dynamic between you and I on this call tremendously, I would think. Yeah. I mean, you know, when I role play this with people and we do them and, and we have people write their own version because um, I want people to sound authentic. You know, one of the things I always ask them is, you know, you know, who thinks they're in control of this conversation? Most people think. Most people say, oh, the customer is. Well, and I say, well, who's really in control? I'm like, you are. Yeah. Um, and that's the piece. And, and the critical, where that happens, where that actually occurs is actually at the end. When I say, hey, what's even got us here? Like, I'm not even trying to dig into the pain. I don't care what they've told me. I want to know what got us here. That's the part that makes them start ask, start talking. And then I can start going deeper onto the other question. And that's for me, it's the, hey, I've earned the right to ask these questions because yeah. we've said we can each ask each other questions. I We've earned the right that we can hang up on each other, for lack of a better phrase. And then I'm going in politely, professionally with the, so what's even got us here? What's happening in the world, right? Mm-hmm. And that gets them warmed up. So, and and it's super helpful to try and for my experience and how I teach and what the results I've seen and what my clients have seen. That's what they like about it. Yeah. It, it makes sense in terms of getting them to open up as they start to share. It's like anything is you start to have that conversation and you start to unwind and share, you, you end up sharing even more usually than you, you typically plan on. Yep. And that's where the gold is. Yep. That's that makes a lot of sense. This next highlight is from Cassandra Anderson, who is now the VP of Revenue Operation at Drips. We talked about the challenges of cutting through the noise, the importance of understanding the expectations of your relationship with your buyer, and actually coming through to make that commitment and hold up both ends of the bargain. As we were just talking before we jumped on, you know, the amount of emails in our inboxes every day in LinkedIn, all of the in-mails, all the, all the different noise, how every website seems to sound and look the same these days. How do you cut through all of that? And as a seller or someone who enables those teams and works with those teams, how do you teach your sellers to find that understanding? Well, I think to, there's a, the most important part is active listening. Mm-hmm. So we aren't actually taught how to listen necessarily. And there's a lot to break down here in, in what I mean by active listening. One of the things that we did at OptiMove was we brought in a consultant, training consulting firm, uh, Paul Bramson, and he teaches listening as a framework. So we'll call active listening, listening and acknowledging and clarifying and explaining. So he calls it LACE. And so we use the LACE framework. We teach our reps how to really active listen. But it's it's really important more than listening is at some point you have you have to, you know, be in the world of them. It's not listening to agree. It's not listening to disagree. It's not listening to respond. 
And that is a lot of times what we've learned by doing or watching or participating as, as we've grow. But this is active listening. So it's listening to really get in their world and, and ultimately understand what they need. And then as in sales, the whole goal isn't to sell something unless the person really needs it. So how do you make a difference in the life of that person over there? I think that's where sales has changed so much. If you look at, you know, you go back to the old school books of, of selling, like when it was truly not in a digital format, but very relationship driven and kind of the, the, the professional salesman type thing, you know, gets up with their briefcase every day and meets their clients in office. That's not happening as much anymore. And we're all really informed. We're not getting a new product because that salesman showed up at our office and I never heard about it before. We've all looked, we've been marketed to, we've been educated. We have all these review sites, all these places to go see. So I like your idea of understanding more of where the buyer is at and less of understanding, do they understand what I'm selling? Do they understand what I'm telling them? No, like, do I, as the seller, understand where my buyer is and what their needs are? That's right. I mean, gone are the days of the true hunt. Buyers are very well educated before you find them in the hunt state. Like We hunt them and they're already educated. They know oftentimes the problem that they have, they're looking for a solution for it. They've educated themselves on the solutions available to solve those problems and and now you're being brought in. And so who wins the deal is someone who has really heard, not just heard, but also not just heard in a way that like, oh, I heard you say, but more like, oh, I hear your pain. This is what I'm hearing. What I'm hearing is that what would make a real difference for you is if you could listen to the, well, use your product. So you could know in advance, like what's costing you business and where sentiment matters and how your customers are re- receiving your sales team, right? Or something like that, right? So you you hear past what they're saying into the pain and, and into the solution. And you kind of bring that to bear. Now that's what, that's, what's going to make a difference. Yeah, I, I like that because I think what you're at, what you're listening for is not just what they're saying, but you're actually listening for, to me, like like those those subtle cues that we get when we're maybe a little easier, maybe face to face, a little tougher sometimes over video, very tough when like presenting or four different, 10 different people are on a, on a screen and we're trying to look at the little, little squares, but <laughs> it's you're trying to turn it around and really understand where that buyer sits. So how do you get to that understanding? You talked about in in one of our last conversations, it was clarification and getting to agreement. Take me through kind of that whole idea and then how it applies in the sales process. Well, firstly, life is created in agreement. And I use that all the time when someone in any kind of relationship breakdown, Mm-hmm. You know, if, I, if I'm talking to a rep and maybe the rep's having a problem with the, the prospect or even the critic in their deal right now, you have a buying committee and there's usually someone who wants your competitor. So it, any, it could be in life, like, oh, someone's having a, a difficulty in relationship with their spouse or with their children, right? And as you, as you lead people, you care about that side of their life as well. So I say this a lot, life is created in agreement. And what I mean by that, is relationships, you can always find in a breakdown in communication, really where, or any relationship, a breakdown in any relationship is rooted in three things, intention, expectations, and communication. And since we're talking largely about sales and technology sales and EQ in in that arena, let's let's talk about it in that respect. Mm -hmm. So you have an intention as a seller to (laughs) sell some stuff right? To be effective at your job, to feel successful. Like that's your intention, like by and large. And a buyer has the intention of looking like a hero at their company, being able to solve some big problem, right? That's their intention. So, you know, when you can align the intention and effectively communicate, that's the third part, right? So we have intention, expectation, and communication. 
effectively communicate the expectations that are a direct result of your intention. Mm -hmm. So if my intention is to solve a pain point, then my expectations are that you're not going to give me a 10 minute PowerPoint, a five minute brief about your company. You're going to ask the questions about your product that can solve my problem. And then you're going to show it to me. (laughs) So, you know, If you don't do that, if your intention is to talk about your product and tell me why you're the best and like in your expectation is to be able to go through a scripted sales process, which, hey, I'm in sales rev ops and enablement. So my job is to script the process for a rep, right? (laughs) But I'm not knocking it. But if the intentions aren't aligned and the expect the expectations specifically derived from the intention aren't aligned, there's going to be a breakdown. But that's just the simple fact of it. And what that breakdown can look like for you as a seller mm-hmm. is that they move on and buy from your competitor who listened. Yep. And did the I, demo. Yeah, and, and then didn't do the demo and let you also probably see whatever it was you wanted to see rather than let me take you from, you know, start to finish everything about my platform in 45 minutes. Okay. Did I wow you? Or are you impressed with me? Right. Which is, <laughs> I think that the, the, the other side that we get every single day, because up next, we have a clip from an interview I did with Ali Rastiello. She's the VP of RevOps at Health Catalyst. Ali had some amazing perspectives on how her team enables sales internally. And I love learning about her requirements as a buyer and how RevOps is shaping the buying decision. Also, check out how she runs her SDR team. You serve sales and I'm thinking I'm marketing to sellers. I have a sales team that sells into sellers, right? We're trying to unlock all of these, what makes a, a seller effective, but you just hit it on the head with what makes just change making effective. And I think sales is a lot more about that these days. Yeah. Everything that, I mean, like businesses have the technologies or the, um, the services they need in place for the most part. Mm -hmm. And when you're coming in, you're basically trying to disrupt that and say, do you really need that vendor? I mean, we're a better vendor. And then, you know, and it's sort of like changing that language to, more about the pain points and understanding what they don't like or what they're not getting out of their current vendor and then mm-hmm. flipping the script on like, well, what can you get from us instead? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like when I would tell people in marketing or what I tell people in marketing is you're not, you're not talking about the product. You're talking about the pain point the person has and yeah. how we solve it so that when they're looking to solve that pain point, we pop up, not, you know, this product that has a nebulous name that nobody understands. It, that makes so so much sense. We, we become so, I know that the term is always, oh, we're customer centric, but I think most organizations are very them centric. You go to a website and you get to look at the names of the products. They don't mean anything to you as the buyer, right? You're like, what is this? And then I got to dig in because it's some fancy or clever name that someone came up with but it doesn't just tell me what it is as simple as we can get. I think it seems to be better. hundred percent. I'm curious because you are a evaluator, buyer, like decision maker on sales technology. And so everybody that listens to this podcast, I know is probably going, man, what gets her attention? So right there, what, what strikes a chord with you right now and what kind of gets your attention? Um, I, I hate buzzwords. I hate that we're like, oh, AI is the new future and intent was the future like two years ago, four years ago, whatever. It's kind of all the same thing. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just a buzzword. What gets my attention is simplifying things Mm -hmm. and uh, a simple interface and things that do multiple tasks for me or or help me do multiple tasks. Mm -hmm. Um, We... For example, we are always struggling. Like I think everyone struggles with data. So mm-hmm. data orchestration is a big like thing that I tout all the time, but I need uh-huh. a platform that does more than enriches, more than um, cleans it up, more yeah. than uh, what some of the out of the box features are of those typical orchestration platforms. And mm-hmm. so um, the one I ended up settling on 
and they they do kind of everything they can do they can manipulate your data in any kind of way mm-hmm. and they've got all these like pre-built recipes that they've learned over the years and they give you a data person to help you build everything out and and meet your needs and so i really um I tend to like, you know, gravitate to those kinds of people that are those kinds of solutions that help me solve a pain point, which is kind of what I got to in the first place and makes it easy. I I think the makes it easy button and what you just went through is like all the boxes you check probably Mm pre-sales to know if this is going to work. Like not just, okay, it's a cool feature. It's a cool capability, but you just laid out a whole setup there that I think most organizations know but I don't know if they know how important it is pre-sales, which is making sure that Allie or any buyer on the other side of this has the support team and is going to have somebody dedicated. It's not going to change and move around a lot because that's got to be a headache Mm -hmm. that you have the recipes. I think that was a good call out and we're going to get to your recipes soon, but the recipes (laughs) around like, how do I use this? How, what, what does good look like other places or what does good look like for you so that I know when, when I'm, being successful with this solution. I think that's critical. Yeah. When we did the research with B2B buyers, they said that 88% of the time, the seller knew the product features and functionality, right? But they didn't meet them where they were in terms of understand my business, understand how it's going to work for me, kind of solve or put that picture together. How do we help our sellers get there? What's the role that RevOps plays in helping sellers get there? I think, um, you know, part of my RevOps team is an enablement team. Mm -hmm. And that enablement team is is there to, one, you know, get them to understand the product and how it's purchased and how how we should be pitching it, selling it, all of those kinds of things, but also helps coach them on how to get the information they need out Mm -hmm. of those um out of the the buyer right Mm -hmm. there should be a series of questions and not like a check the box question of like how many employees do you have or you know how many servers do you need or you know whatever question series of questions you're asking um but it should be more around business objectives what are you struggling with how do you think um our solution can fit in like it's really getting down to the crux of what do you need from us solution wise people wise education wise for your team and i think that the the technologies that are crushing it in the industry know how to do this well like mm-hmm. i'll give salesforce a shout out sometimes i'm like y'all need to calm down cuz i i don't need all the things you're trying to offer me uh-huh. in order to make us more, a more sticky customer or to buy more from you. Um, but in their, you know, in that way, they're also like, Hey, Allie, tell me your business objectives and let me figure out what products we have that could help you and let what demos I can set up, what trainings we can set up for your team, what um, other exercises like they went through and did, Um, an architecture with us, like just a, let's update the architecture drawings that you have of everything Salesforce. So like they do stuff like that with us Uh on a regular basis to make sure that they keep us ingratiated to them and that they are offering this fully rounded, you know, adoption methodology of their platform. And I think that if, more of these tech companies out there could do that instead Mm -hmm. of just the speeds and feeds. I'm going to sell this to you and then bounce or I'm going to sell it to you and we'll have somebody set you up to get started. And then, you know, crickets after that. Call 1-800, whatever to get, (laughs) get service or or go to our our service offline. Open a ticket and we'll get to it someday. Uh Um, You know, I think that's probably the way to really build up that stickiness and that rapport. As we approach the end of this episode, we're rounding it out with one of the last highlights from an interview with Casey Stinson, VP of Sales Enablement and Product Marketing at Co-op Solutions. We touched on why emotion is the currency of your buyers and the value of consultative selling. Make sure to give that a listen. You, you shared something with me and I will pull this quote because I thought this was very profound. And I think okay. your CRO said it. It was 
emotion is the currency of our buyers. Yes. So that points to me that someone's sentiment, someone's engagement, how a buyer feels about the engagement is critical, not only to the success of a deal, but also something your CRO is very focused on. How yeah. do you measure or get reads on that qualitative side of, of everything? So the way that we, I, I don't think, and I'd be open to ideas on how to measure that other than, not, yeah. um, you know, as a, as an impact, but I would say that we hear often through peer-to-peer learning opportunities that we make available through our sales enablement channels, um, the importance of being um, one who connects with human connection, being mm-hmm. genuine. Um, it's I think it's easier to do business with people you enjoy. Um, Mm -hmm. so making sure you're building that connection is so important. So as far as a measure, I I can't pinpoint anything specific other than we hear about it often. We're training on it often to make sure that those types of competencies are scaled. And, um, it really takes very careful and selective execution um, so hearing how others are able to finesse that is important to share. It's, it's a tough question. And I, and I threw that out there because I think it's the, the one thing that we all struggle with, right. Is like, mm-hmm. it's really easy to see the activities that are being done in a sales room. But now with most people either working remote or in a hybrid environment, meeting people over zoom or different video aspects, like getting a, a pulse on how a buyer feels has become even more of a, a challenge, I think, than ever before. Um, the feedback loops, though, I think is what you're talking about. And again, it goes back to your first point on trust with your sellers. Do you get those anecdotes from buyers that come back often that you kind of say, ooh, I, we, we've won this deal because we've really wowed that person or impressed that buying group? Is that kind of the metric that you go by then? Uh, yes. Um, And actually, just very recently, I had one of our sellers read me a thank you note after closing a deal from the buyer. And it was exactly that. It was like, I, you know, I knew you were the type of people who we wanted to work with after our very first meeting. You were engaged. You, you know, knew, knew X, Y, Z about me. And to that very point, I think the end was actually something like, and it sure makes it a whole lot easier to do business with people that you enjoy. And so yep. we're looking forward to this partnership. So it's absolutely referenced. Um, we are always analyzing our um, selling process, our buying. We want to make our organization as client centric as possible. So we listen to our clients very frequently. Um, we have client councils that we set up and various listening posts. So we will often receive these verbatim type feedbacks that talk about the importance of our people and how our people at Co-op Solutions are one of our most valuable assets. Um, so I absolutely agree that people, that connection, the emotional currency, um, all play a huge role in um, buying and selling. It, it is human to human. And, and I think you, you said it spot on. We don't buy from people we usually don't like or don't trust. Mm-hmm. Right? I, I can't think of a big purchase. Maybe if you didn't have to talk to anybody and we, we that's a whole nother topic of discussion. But in B2B sales, where if you don't talk to somebody, I think the recent stat from Gartner was like, self-service, although people are saying from a buyer side, oh yeah, I don't want to talk to sales. The buyer remorse from those that do that self-service side, do their own research and don't talk to sales is upwards of like 80%. Wow. So there's a challenge on that side. And I think at the end of the day where sales has the opportunity or the upper hand is to be that trusted advisor, which you're working to do. Yes. So much. Completely agree. And 
Um, I am very certain I'm not the first one to talk about consultative selling here um, and the importance of it because you are hitting the nail on the head when you say people don't think they want to interact with people because they don't want to be sold, but at the same time, they want advice, they want to be consulted with, they want expertise in the area that they're looking to buy from. And so we have to train our sales team to be that consultative partner and make it less about selling and more about consulting and helping the buyer achieve the outcomes that they want to achieve to um, have a successful partnership and a valuable partnership on both both sides. And does that influence then the content and the training? Is a lot of that content I'm thinking and training that you're doing probably not just product knowledge? There's probably a lot more that you go into. What are some of those topics? It does. So we train on consultative selling and we set our tools up in a way that really enables consultative selling and helps to guide a seller if that is not their strongest competency or if they're still learning how to be a consultative seller. Um, And the way that we set up those tools are through, again, a lot of listening and asking open-ended questions. Um, And then learning again how to finesse your um your responses and your listening based on what they're saying and based on what they're really saying um and you and i had this brief conversation in the past about okay someone can say the same thing five different ways and we all know it means something different each time right so crisis Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I remember it well. Uh-huh. Yes. So taking a cue um, from a buyer and stopping to dig in where it's really necessary is key to success. So we're teaching these competencies, we're teaching sell- selling skills, um, and we're also designing our tools and training to help educate and train our team. Well, thanks so much for listening to this episode of B2B EQ. If you want more sales insights, I highly recommend listening to the full episodes from our selected speakers and the other episodes we might not have shared yet. We'll link to those in the show notes. So stay tuned for more episodes down the line. And thanks again for joining us on B2B EQ. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.